an honor to be with you again. Our topic is when revival comes. You know, I had mistakenly imagined that when the Spirit of God moved in the earth, that it would banish evil, that we would see the triumph of the kingdom of God and the complete recession, the, the darkness would just disappear. Well, I don't believe that's the case. You know, when God called Gideon to, to lead a renewal movement, he began that at night because he was afraid of his adversaries. Well, we're going to have to have the courage to take the truth of Jesus Christ and stand in the public square in the face of voices that don't agree with us. We don't have to be angry or belligerent or mean-spirited and certainly not violent, but we're going to have to have the courage to hold an opinion that may not be completely embraced by the broader culture. Jesus is Lord and His truth will triumph, but He needs you and I to be messengers, ambassadors for His kingdom in this most unique season. What an exciting time to serve the Lord. Grab your Bible, get a notepad, most of all, open your heart. I want to begin a little short study. I know I want to work on it in this session and in the one tomorrow. Lord willing, but uh, I struggle. Titles are the hardest part of what I do. The, the messages themselves aren't so challenging, but the titles, I'm always kind of stumped. So, But I, I think when revival comes is, is where I would like to begin this. And the word revival is a little overused. It could be an awakening. It could be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. It can be a moving. It's when God takes us from one state of being to a completely different one. Um, and it's typically, it's God initiated. It's not something we do. It's under his control, but I, I believe that, that we have actually entered into one of those periods. We've talked about it a lot through the years. We have some friends who have an anointing as an evangelist, and we've done a lot of things through the years. We've gone to Bridgestone Arena, and we have traveled, and we've gone outdoors and indoors, and we put one foot in and one foot out, and I don't believe any of those things were inappropriate or wrong, but God's doing something right now that I've never seen him do before. And I can't really attribute to anything other than a moving of the Spirit of God. Amen. You know, we are, it was two weeks ago tomorrow that, that I got on the plane to leave, and we've had two weeks of unprecedented breakthroughs. Amen. Just unthinkable, unimaginable, unplanned. Amen. And when I'm, when I'm outside the gravitational pull of the nation and the media and all those things, and my, my calendar's busy, you know, God is moving in the midst of confusion and turmoil. He didn't stop the turmoil and eliminate the confusion. It's just right in the midst of it. He said, watch this. You know, we've watched Roe v. Wade be overturned, which is unimaginable. And as marvelous as that is, all it's really done is taken the discussion away from the courts. That was imposed upon us without the will of the people. And so now we're in a place where it's returning the choice regarding the sanctity of human life back to the people. Each state is going to have to decide. Much of the messaging that I've been hearing, and I've just been hearing it in snippets because I've been busy and I was out of the country, but it's really disingenuous and misleading. All that was said was that judicial fiat is not going to impose the ending of the lives of our children. Will I get to have a voice in that? So it's a very significant time for the church. You know, one of the things it seems to me that is being peeled back in these, these most remarkable days, and they are most remarkable days, is the charade of our faith being separate from our larger lives has been completely exposed. It's just been completely exposed and, and we were duped into this or walked into it willingly or we did it with hearts that were misguided. But for decades, Christians have been told that our worldview was unwelcome in so many, many places. You could believe in God if you wanted to. You could have a Judeo-Christian, a biblical worldview, but, but we were told you shouldn't bring that many places. Have you heard that? I have heard that. You certainly shouldn't bring it to the public schools. We didn't want Ten Commandments there. We couldn't read our Bibles there. You shouldn't pray there. If the kids want to pray, go find a flagpole. There was very limited access to college campuses and they've been increasingly intolerant. And certainly in corporate settings, they didn't want you praying. I mean, I have many friends who work in the medical arenas or legal communities and, and we've talked about, you know, how can you pray without, without risking lawsuits? We've lived in that world, right? I've got the right group of people. Decade upon decade upon decade, and it's become more and more narrow in that, that biblical worldview. They said, don't, don't bring that into the public. It's not welcome. Until now. 
And the logic that was provided for us as we were conceding the field was rooted in the idea that if one person was offended, then the majority should be silent out of respect for that offended individual. And we all nodded quietly and said, well, okay. So we stopped praying at work or taking our Bible to work or praying with our kids or praying at the ball fields or praying in our schools. So I've watched these last couple of weeks. Now we have corporate America offering to pay travel expenses for abortions or to reimburse employees if they're arrested for protesting the ruling of the Supreme Court, which happens to protect children. Well, I have a question. I'm a part of this, so I'm not throwing a stone. I'm holding up a mirror, and I'm in the picture that's looking back. But where has the Christian leadership been for the last four or five decades? What are we going to say? How, we've been either distracted or just bullied into silence. What would our nation look like today if we'd spent the last 50 years being advocates for godliness and righteousness with the same enthusiasm and determination that we see being demonstrated by those with a very different worldview now? Does that feel right to you? It's awkward. It's a little uncomfortable. I mean, I was in Israel not very many years ago, a handful of years ago, when the Supreme Court ruled on a different topic, redefined marriage in that Obergefell case. And I saw pictures in the media internationally. I, I wasn't home. I saw pictures of the rainbow projected on the White House. And I came back and all the messaging was about being tolerant and understanding and open-minded. I have to tell you, God is moving. And I believe because of many things, many of which have been initiated since we were introduced to COVID-19 and this, this expression of authoritarianism that we hadn't seen before, we are awake in a way we've never been. And I would submit to you, we can be silent no longer. We're going to have to use our voices. We don't have to be angry or belligerent or condemning or critical, but we're going to have to be advocates for the truth. I think the protection of our children is a wonderful thing. Amen. Now, I don't imagine everybody will agree with that. I don't imagine we're going to get unanimous response, but I can't imagine under the umbrella of a biblical worldview, a Judeo-Christian worldview, that we would think we can sacrifice the lives of our children on the altars of convenience. Some choices we're not allowed to make. There is a God. Amen. And again, we don't have to be angry, but we're going to have to have the courage. Now, here's the awkward truth. Abortion has touched all of us directly and indirectly. We're more than 60 million lives into this. So we're going to have to be willing to help one another. We'll have to walk gracefully through this in forgiveness and healing and restoration and renewal, but with determination to honor God in our nation. He is showing us a possibility of a new future, a new response to him. We would scarcely have dared to even ask for this in prayer just a few months ago. And now we're standing and looking at the reality. God is moving. So I want to take our time and, and, and see if we can start to understand what will that look like? All of my life I've heard about revivals and renewals and outpouring of the Spirit and at the end of the age, there'll be this wonderful move of the Spirit of God. You've heard versions of this. Some people have charts and graphics. And, I mean, there's libraries written on this. Well, I believe we're just on the, the, the front end of watching that. Now, the, the outcomes are beyond me. I don't apologize for that. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the, the secret things belong to the Lord, the revealed things. He's made not, not everything God tells us. And I don't think it's particularly helpful to try to spend your time figuring out what God said he's not going to tell you. I don't know about you, but it, it's just almost overwhelming with, to, for, for me to keep up with what I know to do. That loving your neighbor as yourself thing, that's a full-time job for me, 24-7. <laughs> And I've got pretty decent neighbors. <laughs> so 
So I want to take some minutes and I want to take a, a bit more than that today and in the next session at least and, and see if we can start to imagine what, what some of the components we might see. I just traveled with the, some folks to Israel and I can talk to them about what they'll see as they go through security at the airport in Israel or, or, or what that first time they, they wake up to an Israeli breakfast, what's going to be on it or what it's going to look like when you see the Sea of Galilee or what the temperature will be like at the Dead Sea. I can give you some of those components so it's not just one shock after another. Well, I believe we need a little bit of a biblically informed anticipation of what's ahead of us. Does that seem right? Because I'm telling you, I talk to a lot of Christians across the country. I do interviews in multiple cities on a regular basis, and, and there's the fatigue factor. I hear the Christians say, you know, I'm just tired of the I'd rather not look or hear anymore. And I'm like, well, that's really nice, but until we get to the victory, we don't get to tap out. Don't want to. Amen. Don't want to quit. Right. Don't want to forfeit my place. Right. Don't want to abdicate my responsibilities. You know, there's been a series of commercials I've seen in various forms about parenting, and the idea was that you don't get a day off. The parent can't roll into their toddler and say, you know, mommy's not feeling well. Take care of yourself. I mean, they're, they're funny little commercials because when you hear it, you realize the absurdity of that. We all understand that parenting is 24-7 and well, so is serving the Lord. So let's start with this notion. I think that, that God is going to move and the, the, the outpouring of his spirit and the, the, these opportunities for the kingdom to be extended and the truth of God to be held in, in a higher place is going to take place in the midst of chaos, not in the absence of it. Thank you for that enthusiastic response to that piece of good news. Look at Psalm chapter two and verse one. It says, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? You can spend 10 minutes on the internet and you can have a thousand conspiracy theories. Right? I mean, they'll give you names and pedigrees and pictures and don't do that. It's not helpful. Spend more time in your Bible than you do on the internet reading conspiracy theories. You'll be in a better place. You will spend more time praying in the spirit than you do on the internet, reading the news about the people you don't like. You'll be in a better place. Amen. But David said, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. They don't want to be encumbered by God's truth. They don't want to be encumbered by objective truth. They want to tell us everything is subjective and every person is a law unto themselves and that it's arrogant or narrow-minded or quaint to suggest that there's really only one way to make peace with God or even that there is a God. They would rather suggest to us that man is the measure of all things, that the human spirit is the most triumphant expression that any human being will ever experience. Oh, baloney. The triumphant part of human beings is that we're made in the image of Almighty God. Amen. And to the degree that we reflect His holiness and His goodness and His love, we can contribute to the betterment of humanity to the degree that we don't. It's deceptive. Just a casual reading of human history tells you what we're capable of. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He doesn't stop there. Then he rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, I don't doubt that there's, there are those who plot and scheme against the purposes of God or God's people who would like to diminish the influence of our faith or diminish the influence of the word of God or diminish our freedoms to talk about Jesus or they would like to diminish a Judeo-biblical worldview or definition of family or marriage or human sexuality. There's no question those things are in play in the public square and being highly debated and contested and some of the most unthinkably immoral positions are being pushed into the mainstream and we're told we shouldn't say anything, but we are going to say something. But in the midst of the chaos, we see God moving. He hasn't stopped the voices or eliminated the dialogue. 
He simply said, watch what I can do. I can do things that have seemed impossible. I believe we'll see more of that. They told us not too long ago, two million of us wouldn't survive the pandemic and their numbers were grossly wrong. I'm grateful. I don't think they were intentionally wrong. I don't think they had enough data to know they were giving us a warning, but God intervened. We're seeing him intervene again in the most remarkable ways. There's two things that I've told you this before, but I just had another firsthand visit with it that are going to happen in the months ahead and they're going to accelerate. They're going to grow. You'll have to look, you'll have to pay attention because the majority of the people that have microphones and put people in front of them will not affirm these things any more than they will affirm the Supreme Court's recent ruling as a remarkable breakthrough for grace on the behalf of children and families. An affirmation of the greatest parts of our heritage as a people, that every life is sacred before God. No matter how strong or weak, no matter the color of our skin, that every life is valuable. There's a possibility. It's not a fate to complete, but there's a possibility that one of the darkest chapters in our history could come to a close. That's a wonderful gift. But you're going to see with in, in, in increasing activity from God and increasing antagonism from his opponents, this, this regathering of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. There's still an enormous part of the pop Jewish population scattered throughout the earth. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 24, God said, he said, I will take you out of the nations. If you want to have a little game, circle all the times in this passage where God says, I will. He's not looking to somebody else. God says, this is what I'm going to do. And I would just suggest for your own reflection, if the creator of heaven and earth says he's going to do something, that's a good position for you to hold. He said, I will take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And you will live in the land I gave your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God and I will save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I've been visiting Israel since I was a boy. It was very much at that time a third world country. The roads were two lane. Many of them were not paved well. The primary agricultural crops were citrus. They struggled in the hotels where we would stay. You couldn't eat the food unless it was cooked or you could peel it. You, you certainly wouldn't have eaten a salad or something fresh. They just weren't to the place yet that was safe for those of us who were visiting. Today, Israel has the finest fruits and vegetables. They sell them to the most elite markets of Europe. They have one of the leading high-tech corridors in the world, more high-tech startups than any place other than Silicon Valley. They're one of the most technically sophisticated nations in the world, one of the most robust economies. They've come from over a hundred nations. We've heard of startup companies. Israel is a startup country. And they've done it in the midst of the most brutal neighborhood. But the part that's most exciting to me, and it's as remarkable and as dramatic as our own Supreme Court rulings of late, is what God is doing in the hearts of the people. If you read the sequencing there, he said, I'll bring them back from the nations of the world, and then I will begin to change their hearts. They came back after World War II broken, decimated. I, I can't, I, it's impossible for me to even understand the, the depth of the rejection that the Holocaust represented. There were no nations in the world that wanted them. There was no place for them to go. The, the, the process that the UN put forward at the urging of the United Nations was really just trying to solve a rather inconvenient global problem because the world knew they were being annihilated systematically. God said, I'll bring them back and then I'll begin to change their hearts. He is. Amen. I have some of the dearest friends in my life who are Israelis. And there are many points on which we don't agree, but every time I see them, there are more and more points on which we do agree. 
It wasn't very long ago I would have told you that the, the typical Israeli on the street was far more comfortable with a Muslim than they were with a Christian. That's a little blind to us because we understand the, the neighborhood in which they live and how difficult it is. The Israelis have conceded the point, at least the, the man on the street will concede the point that the Iranians will have a nuclear weapon in, in spite of all the chirping that our talking heads do. And they believe them when they say as soon as they have the capability, they'll do their best to deploy it against Israel. In spite of that, they weren't more afraid of the Muslim communities. They were more afraid of the Christian communities because the Christians have killed far more Jews through the centuries than the Muslims have ever dreamt of. And I don't mean just the Nazis. In most of the European nations prior to the World War II, they, they, they weren't welcome to own property. In Shakespeare's writing, the Jewish characters are greedy, selfish, self-absorbed. In Spain, in the Spanish Inquisition in the 15th century, the Jews' property was confiscated. They were expelled from the nation. I mean, I could take you through country after country. In Russia, the pogroms, if there was a famine or a drought or some sort of a plague, it was common for the Orthodox Church to blame the Jewish communities and they would release the Cossacks on them and that they would slaughter the people. Fiddler on the roof gives you a little window into that mindset. But I'm grateful to tell you in the last few years that even the Israeli on the street has come to understand that the best friends they have in the world are evangelical Christians. God is changing their hearts. God is changing their hearts. It's going to increase and intensify. They will pass us in their advocacy for Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. They'll become the greatest advocates our world has ever known for our Lord. I hope I get to see that. God is moving in the hearts of the Jewish people. We don't visit Israel because we love the rocks. We visit Israel because we love the people. And we go as ambassadors for the kingdom of God. Not to point out their weaknesses. One of the most awkward opportunities of my academic career was being in class at the Hebrew University. You know, when you're in shorts and a t-shirt, our differences weren't very apparent. And I was there for several weeks before they, anybody understood I was a pastor. I'll never forget the day the whole class turns around. They said, we've never seen one of you. <laughs> we've certainly never talked to one of you. Why are you so angry with us? And it was still a time when we could have pretty honest conversations in an academic setting. God is changing the hearts of the Jewish people. It's going to grow and, and it, it won't grow. It won't continue without chaos and confusion. They're about to have their fifth election in three years. A lot of turmoil, a lot of fatigue in that nation too. They live in a tough neighborhood. God has blessed them in the most remarkable ways and they're flourishing, but it isn't easy. It isn't without conflict and confrontation. The second thing I can tell you God is doing, and I've told you this before, but it's intensifying. There's a shaking taking place. The middle's in trouble. If you're a straddle the fence, you better get off. It's going to get increasingly difficult. In my mind, it's, you know, we used to have, um, we were taking care of horses and the, 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 there'd oftentimes be wooden fences, but if the horse was too aggressive, you'd put an electric wire around the inside of the fence. And I think God's, if, if anybody here ever touched an electric fence? One of those wonderful summer mornings and there's a lot of dew on the ground and your feet are good and wet. You touch that fence. You can feel the anointing. <laughs> well, my, my, in my mind's eye, the picture I have is there's been a lot of us sitting on the fence and God's about to turn on the electricity. <laughs> I'd move before he does because it's going to be fun watching. <clears throat> but he's going to purify his church. He's going to purify his church. In Matthew 16 is a verse that changed my life when, when it became a living thing in me. Jesus said, I'll build my church in the gates of Hades. Hell, hell will not overcome it. But he went on to say, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, there's, there's a very, very significant role for the church to play in the conclusion of this age. And to do that, we have to allow the Spirit of God to clean us up. We've been sloppy and casual and indifferent. 
We've stood so close to the world that we, it's as if we were in camouflage in our language and our dreams and our aspirations and the things we were hoping for our children and the things we were pushing them to achieve and become. They were really indistinguishable from, from, from the people who were not honoring the Lord. And now God has begun to say that he's called us out of darkness. You see, he can't entrust us with the authority that is going to be needed at the end of the age to take the place we'll have to stand against the darkness that is emerging. The brazen ungodliness and immorality and the boldness, the, the heinous things I have heard in these demonstrations in these last few weeks are almost beyond comprehension. And to have the courage to stand there without anger or, or condemnation and to say, no, I don't agree. We're going to have to allow the Spirit of God to do something in us. We'll have to find mercy and forgiveness where we have participated in godly things and, and have been silent or haven't used our voices. See, we'll have to be clean. We'll have to desire to be clean. Look at Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word. Now, here's the description of the church that Jesus is coming for. To present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. We've had a lot of discussions and a lot of sermons and a lot of books written on the, the gift of righteousness and the, the righteousness that's ours through faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe in that. We are righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. But our response to that gift of righteousness is to choose to lead righteous lives, not to earn our way into heaven or to, to qualify for the blessings of God. But the appropriate expression of gratitude is a heartfelt desire to lead righteous lives. And if we aren't interested in living righteously, we're going to have to start to talk to one another and help one another and go, what are we thinking? We've lived so presumptively around the grace of God. We're so cavalier with, oh, he'll forgive me of this. You hold your employer typically in higher esteem than we, we hold the Lord. You wouldn't imagine stealing from your employer or abusing your coworkers or intentionally lying or misleading or ignoring corporate policies. If you know you're breaking those things, do you think you could just go to your supervisor and go, oh, sorry. Hey, look, you know, I've been stealing for years. How do you think I got that third home? But I've really got about all the real estate I want now, so I just wanted to know I'm not gonna take anything else I don't deserve. All good, right? I don't think it would be. And yet we've treated the Lord that way. No, I mean, I don't really give, you know, I don't know about that giving thing. I don't, but I mean, the morality deal. I mean, God, you know, I don't, you know, I just, I kind of did what felt good or what I wanted to do. Or, and I, we, we have been so loose and sloppy. And then the part that's so uncomfortable to me is we think we can just casually say to the Lord, oh, yeah. <laughs> No harm, no foul. Everybody's doing it. No, folks. We've got to come with sincere hearts and say, God, I'm a broken person. I'm inconsistent. There have been chapters and seasons in my life that were far less than sterling. And I want to come to repent of that. And in humility, acknowledge to you that I am not that. You see, we spend more time trying to hide our ungodliness from one another than we do coming to the Lord and asking him to be clean. I know, because I, I interact with lots and lots of people, and our primary concern is someone might know we've struggled. Not that we willingly walked into the struggles, See, I think it's far more destructive for us to hide our sin than it is to say to the Lord, Lord, I need to be clean. 
Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And he's begun the time of preparation. I want to encourage you to begin to talk to the Lord. Look, the church is not a place for perfect people. This is not the hall of fame of righteousness. I understand church far more to be a triage unit for the halt and the lame and the broken. Right? But that's not to excuse sloppiness. If you're purposely living in disobedience to truth that you know, please stop it. It will destroy you. And one of the things that happens when the Spirit of God begins to move is that the choices will be pushed to you again. But it would be wrong to imagine that you can choose the Lord whenever you want to. That's a, that's a mistaken presentation of the gospel. I'm an advocate for grace. If you look up grace in the book, you, you might very well find my picture there. Because I have needed it and continue to. But I don't want to live presumptively upon it. Amen. Just as certainly as God is changing the hearts of the Jewish people and establishing them in that land that he promised to them, in the midst of all of the hatred and the turmoil that's directed against them, he is purifying his church. And I don't want you to think he's purifying someone else. I want you to begin to think about your own life and your own, the trajectory of your own faith. Is, does it look as if the Lord is doing something in you different than what he was doing in some season in the past? And if you don't have that sense, begin to talk to him and say, Lord, I don't want to be left behind or left out, or I don't want to be sidelined, or I don't want to be presumptive, or I, I want to follow you. I want to follow him. I promise you, I'm not resting on any laurels. I'm not pointing at before and after pictures. I'm doing everything in my power to say, Lord, I want to participate with you in this season as fully as I know how to do. Amen. Help me do that. And I would encourage you to do something along similar lines yourself. There's one more piece I can tell you that is going to happen as we walk through this. And it goes right along with those two things because how God does that is the most unexpected occurs in the most unexpected ways. It's just almost beyond my, it is beyond my imagination, but you're going to have to anticipate the unexpected. Now that's a paradox. If it's unexpected, how do you anticipate it? Well, I can tell you that what's in front of us is, is beyond what we could dream. And it's going to come, and I tell you that from Scripture, and I, I can give you an almost unlimited, we could spend days on this, but in John chapter 7 and verse 40, Jesus is speaking and said, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. And others said, he's the Christ, the Messiah. But still others ask, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And the people were divided because of Jesus. Some said he's a Messiah, and some said he's a prophet, and some said, you don't know your history, the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem, but they didn't know all their history. And the outcome is there was just confusion and division. Well, you would think if the Messiah was there and raising the dead and opening blind eyes and dancing on the Sea of Galilee, that everybody would be going, that's the man right there. Behold the man. But now they're bickering and arguing and they're arguing from a scriptural position. The division was so deep, it says that some wanted to seize him. We got to shut this guy down. What he's saying is so wrong. And as we walk further into this move of the Spirit of God, I believe we have to anticipate the unexpected. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. There's so many things these days that want to capture us and with the wisdom of men. I love technology. I'm not opposed to it. I'm grateful for all the opportunities it gives us. We can minister to more people in a week now than in all of the years that preceded the week in which we just ministered. And we can do that because of technology. So I'm not opposed to it, but I believe that technology is when God gives us glimpses into his wisdom. 
I think technology is misunderstood when we use it to idolize one another. And I think God's wisdom is greater than mine. That's why I will submit myself to the authority of Scripture. That's why I'm willing to hold to ideas that I know there are many voices these days that are, say, quaint or outdated. I hear Christians saying, we're evolving in our thinking. It makes me a little uncomfortable. Look at Jeremiah 10 and verse 12. It says, God made the earth by his power, and he founded the world by his wisdom, and he stretched out the heavens by his understanding. There seems to me there's a very clear distinction between God's power and God's wisdom and God's understanding and my power and my wisdom and my understanding. You're going to have to decide which you will yield to. Which you will yield to. What is it that you imagine will secure your future? There are many biblical scenarios that I simply could not have anticipated that are unexpected to me. No matter how many times I read them, when I read them, I still go, you know, I, I didn't see that one coming. That's not the way I would have written that story. I wouldn't have sent Samuel to anoint David to be king when he's just a kid, knowing he's going to spend almost two decades living as a fugitive because of the threat that was posed to the existing king, because the same man that anointed Saul to be king comes and anoints David to be king. That's a threat. I just waited to send Samuel to anoint him the day before he really needed to be king. Why make him live in the desert as a fugitive? For... I don't know. But there's a God and it's not me. Aren't you relieved? <laughs> but see, we don't really, I don't think we really spend that much time thinking about it. Jeremiah was called by God to deliver a message to a nation. And the outcome of that is he was reviled by most of the people he delivered the message to. Oh, I mean, that's hard on recruitment. Anybody here want to deliver, deliver a message to a group of people that when you give it to them, are going to hate you because you told them what you said? I mean, I thought being God's person, hearing from God, a revelation of God, a message from God, I mean, they'd like have parades for you. No, not always. Well, that was unexpected to me. I just didn't see that coming either. In John 9, Jesus meets a man who's born blind and he's going to minister to him and restore his sight. So the choice he makes is to spit in the dust and then smear the mud on the man's face. Huh. I mean, I've studied in lots of different schools and been trained in lots of different places. I've never had that healing spit class 101. I mean, we read it like it's just as normal as it can be. And I know that the man that came home seeing was good to go with it because he stood up in the face of some pretty significant antagonism. But that was really unexpected. I mean, it just goes on and on through the narrative in Acts chapter 12. James is beheaded by a wicked king. I'm like, well, wait a minute. How about all those times it says they wanted to stone Jesus, but he just walked through the crowd. James is beheaded. And the poll numbers go up. So he arrests Peter. It's Acts chapter 12. You can read it. But it's a holiday. So he said, well, just hold him in prison. We'll kill him after the holiday. I don't want to lose my polling bump because people are distracted. And God leaves Peter in prison for several days. The night before he's to be executed, there's an angelic jailbreak. Well, couldn't I have gotten out of prison a few days ago? I didn't expect that. Are you willing to follow the Lord if he leaves you in an awkward place for a while, if he smears a little mud on your face? Are you willing to, to have to stand against the jealousy and the hatred of people because they see God doing something in your life and they recognize he's not doing it in their life and so they resent you for it like they did David? Well, God, I didn't think that's what it was like when you moved. God, I didn't know you were going to move in the middle of a pandemic and... <sighs> I didn't expect Moses to miss the promised land. 
I mean, I'm thinking if you can hold a shepherd's staff out over water and the water parts, like big bodies of water, I mean, just try that on the sink at home tonight. See how you do. I mean, if you get some momentum in the sink and you move to the bathtub and you're out in the backyard and the pool moves, go check out Stones River. I mean, you, when you get enough momentum that you're headed for the coastline, you call me. <laughs> and then God says, no. Your disobedience will keep you from that. Well, I didn't see that coming. The, 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 the narrative is far more unexpected to me than it is something I can anticipate. So when I'm standing in this place and I see God doing these most remarkable things, things that were almost unimaginable, certainly couldn't be orchestrated, I have this very deep, deep sense that there's more change afoot. It makes me want to get closer to the Lord, more time in my Bible, more time praying in the Spirit. I want to be listening more carefully. See, it was completely unexpected to me that in Capernaum, the, the center of Jesus' ministry, that the, the Roman centurion would say yes to Jesus and the synagogue ruler would say no. It's illogical to me. There's no way I could anticipate that. That there's just no way I could have imagined that. And I understand that what's in front of me is beyond my imagination. Who will respond and who won't? And the opportunities that will be put before me and my temptation to think it's either unfair or too difficult or I'm tired or I just understand I can't fully anticipate it, but I want to say yes to the Lord. And I've got one more idea I want to give you in this session. And this really has a great deal to do with the events that have been taking place beyond us because it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. What I want to encourage you to do, I want to plant a seed and ask you to think about with me for a bit is what it would mean to cooperate with the grace of God. Because see, when the Spirit of God begins to move in the earth, when, David sent, when God sent Samuel to David's house to anoint him to be king, it was an expression of God's grace. When God sent the angels to get Peter out of prison, it was an expression of God's grace. When, God, when the disciples called Jesus' attention to the man that was blind in John 9, and said, who sinned, his mother or himself, his parents or himself? And Jesus said, your questions are wrong, but watch this. All of those are expressions of God's grace, unearned, unmerited, undeserved. If it has anything to do with merit or payment, it isn't grace. 2 Corinthians 6.1, as God's fellow workers... We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, it has to be possible to receive God's grace in vain or we wouldn't be urged not to do that. So how is it that we could neutralize or nullify God's grace? I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. It's something God expresses towards me, and yet it can be forfeited. Now, he has my attention, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Here's what I want to suggest, that when God intervenes, our now response becomes important. Our response, now, now that God's grace has been made evident, that it's broken into the open, that it's visible, that it's being demonstrated, our now response becomes critical. Because if we don't respond to the grace of God, we forfeit the opportunity. I would suggest that recent activity by the Supreme Court has been an expression of God's grace. We didn't vote on it. We didn't elect somebody to do something. We didn't earn it. It wasn't purchased. It was quite the shock. It's an expression of God's grace, but our response is going to matter in what unfolds in front of us in the months and the years to come. Amen. Or let's say it a different way. God's deliverance, God's intervention demands a response from us. And if we don't respond, it's highly improbable we will hold the victory. 
And I'm not just talking about current court rulings. It's true in our own lives. If God in his grace gives you a revelation of Jesus, you still have to choose him with your whole heart. All of us could give testimonies about times when God's grace has intervened on our behalf and then either because of ignorance or a lack of support or a stubborn determination on our own part to not cooperate, we forfeited the invitation of that grace. Only now we're in a much different season. I'll give you an example from Scripture. It's not just my opinion. Matthew 12, Jesus is speaking again. He said, when an, evil, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and doesn't find it. Just parenthetically, it's worth noting that Jesus believes unclean spirits can occupy people. And if Jesus believes it, you better figure out some way to process it. Then it, the spirit says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. The next sentence is the punchline. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. God in his grace sent Jesus into a specific generation of people. Now, it's true that there was a benefit and opportunity for all generations through the coming of Messiah, but that one generation that got to see and hear and experience him had a very unique opportunity. And the heavenly perspective upon that particular generation of people was that they were wicked. Because when they were given the opportunity, they didn't choose. Now, God is moving in the earth, folks. The evidence is overwhelming. The evidence for the moving of the Spirit of God is greater than the evidence for the moving of wickedness. And there's some pretty significant evidence for the moving of wickedness. We're watching things I never thought I would see. Transgender athletes competing with, it's just nuts. There's not a logical discussion to support it. And we stand there watching it as if it makes perfect sense. And those kind of absurdities are going to increase. Because the wicked will be more wicked and the righteous will be more righteous and it's the middle that's in trouble. That fence is going to get electrified. But we have choices to make. Whether we will cooperate with the Spirit of God and with His cleansing and His purifying and His calling us away from some things that we have tolerated. Look at Amos chapter 4. This is really just a sample. I, the, the, the chapter is worth reading. Because the pattern in the little passage I gave you is repeated over and over in Amos chapter 4. But God is speaking to the people and he said, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who forms the mountains creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. God said, in spite of what I have done, in spite of the judgments that I've brought to you, in spite of the discipline that I brought to you, he said, you have not returned to me. I believe what we have witnessed is an expression of the unearned, undeserved, unmerited Blessing of God to us. The opportunity to write a new chapter in our history as a people. Amen. An opportunity to stand for the sanctity of human life. An opportunity to return more completely to a biblical idea of sexual behavior and habits and patterns. Amen. But it means we'll have to come with repentant hearts Amen. and humility and integrity and honesty. I believe we can see God compound the blessings, the expressions of grace he has brought to us. I do believe that. I think we'll have to be willing to practice our faith in our homes. We'll have to bring the Bible back to our kitchen table. I think the notion of a family Bible is a really good notion. Your children know the sports teams that you support or the athletes the hobbies that you have, and it's okay, it's not wrong, 
But before any of those things, they need to understand the depth of your faith and your commitment to it. To bring prayer back into our homes. We're going to have to have faith with our friends. When we're at the lake or at the ball fields or at the beach. Now here's the trick. It's probably going to require some alteration of behaviors. Because honestly, you can't live like the devil and recruit for the angels. Come on. So we're going to have to start to reconcile some of that. Stop pointing at other people and go, God, you know, it's really true. We're going to have to bring our faith to the marketplace. We're going to have to once again talk about the dignity of the work of work. Folks, the government is not our provider. What are we doing? Every time they want to give you something, they will take more of your freedom and liberty. What are we thinking? We're going to have to talk about what a fair profit is. Exploiting people does not make you smart. The judge of all the earth will come for you. I brought you a prayer. We're going to pick this up tomorrow. God willing. But please, for your take, God is moving in the most profound ways. I mean, amazing, unbelievable ways. If, if we will walk this forward, if we will cooperate with the Lord and we can see state after state after state stand for human life and the dignity of human life, it will be a message to the nations. Now, it won't be easy. It won't be comfortable or convenient. There is tremendous anger and, and the root of the anger is not political or ideological, it's spiritual. It isn't logical. So our responses don't need to be in anger or with great emotion. They need to be with, they can be given in love and mercy and kindness and grace. And most of all, humility because of our own immorality. It's not like abortion hasn't been an issue within the church. Stop hiding our sins. Stop denying it. We have to have the courage to say, you know, I walked that path. Well, I don't want anybody, what do you mean? God is moving. It's as exciting to me in in the book of Daniel. It's so easily lost because we've had so much, so much abundance. Daniel's a slave. He's lived his whole life as a slave. He has really no hope of going back to Jerusalem. But it says about, in in that book, it said, Daniel said, "I, I understood from reading the prophet Jeremiah that it's time for my people to go home. It's time for my people to go home. That the younger generation of people around me are not going to have to serve in a pagan court. That the young people coming behind me are are not going to have to face the temptations of a pagan nation and the humiliation. It's time for my people to go home. And for the entire ninth chapter, Daniel repents of sins that are not a part of his own personal journey, but a part of his people's journey. Folks, I feel like we're in a very similar place. God has opened the door for us. He said, you can have a new future now. You can have a new story. Please don't say, but yeah, but I'm going to the beach. Or I'm, you know, I'm in the middle of a season where being more godly is a little uncomfortable for me. So I borrowed a few verses from the end of Daniel chapter nine, and that's the prayer I brought you. Why don't you stand with me? We'll read it together. Have you found it? Let's read it like we mean it. It's Independence Weekend. Not independence from God, independence from sin and ungodliness and immorality and wickedness. What a wonderful weekend. That makes me want to light some fireworks. Let's read our prayer. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servants. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. 
Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy, O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.